hashtag for this evening, hashtag healthy communities. So um, please feel free to um, tweet anything and, um, and tag hashtag healthy communities. Okay, so really looking forward to this. Over to you, Keta. Thank you very much, Judith, for that lovely welcome. Thank you. So friends, really good to see you all this evening. Uh, this week is school half term and many of us will be spending it with our children, enjoying sunshine, hopefully. And indeed, Platinum Jubilee street parties for some of our children as the summer term comes to end, they will be finishing their schools and embarking on a new journey of adulthood. Most of us can remember as teenagers those exciting moments of independence, of achieving landmarks of adulthood, perhaps learning to drive our first relationship, our first job. Those landmarks all signify moments of increasing maturity, of independence, but each of them remind us that there is no one moment of independence. We don't flip a switch to become a grown up. One day a child, one day an adult. Maturity is a gradual process, a high wire that we walk where most of us benefit from a safety net of parents, family and friends. For most vulnerable children and young people too, there isn't a switch and sadly, very often they don't have the safety net they need. There is now much more emphasis on the transitional period that services extend from age 16 to around 25. There should not be abrupt changes to a service just because someone reaches the age of 18 with its risk of falling between the gap where services don't always join up. In recent years, safeguarding children and adults has become increasingly complex with risks such as sexual exploitation and gangs and violent crime challenging the children's and adults safeguarding workforce to identify opportunities for innovation. Some local authority areas like Brent, thanks to my guest Des Holmes, are already innovating and creating opportunities for more flexible and bespoke support and providing valuable experiences for young people at a key point in their lives. This makes sense in most circumstances, but keeping vulnerable young people safe as they transition from adolescence to adulthood challenges us all to remember that becoming an adult is a process of transition of many moments. So this evening, I'm much excited that we have Des, who is going to share with us how we can all support our children as they embark on their journey to adulthood. So Des is the Director of Research in Practice, an organization that supports evidence-informed practice and policy within child and family and adult services. Her particular interest includes adolescence, safeguarding, interactive practice and transitions. So uh, you probably know that we have one over um, of this uh, Zoom call and we're not going to be able to do justice uh, to this hugely complex area. But we're just going to start off the conversation and Des, if you could just provide us with next 15 minutes or so of an overview to start off that conversation. And thank you very much for giving up, uh, giving up so much of your time to be with us this evening. So friends, here is our uh, guest, Des, to go and take us through that uh, overview. Thank you, Des. Thank you very much for that warm welcome. I'm slightly terrified that I was described as distinguished by Judith, that feels like a heck of a bar to meet. Um, a pleasure to be invited and a pleasure to be working alongside an ambitious uh, local area like Brent. I've got so much time for local colleagues driving forward innovation um, locally. I think the best innovation is always led locally by people who know their patch and are passionate about their public service duties. Um, 
I think uh, I think local innovation is probably the only future worth having. So I'm going to do a whistle stop tour through, as, a, as Ketan says, quite a complicated and complex subject, but you're recording it so you can watch it again later and you can slow it down. I'll try not to get too Welsh if I get too excited. Um, and I've got links at the end for anyone who wants to go and read a bit more and dig a bit deeper. Now, if it all works OK, I should at this point. In a moment, be able to share my screen. Green, how is that looking? Seem okay? I seem to have an odd setting on this. Can you just see one screen? I can see three at my end. Can you just see one slide? No, I, I can see uh, no, two. Uh, hmm. yes. I wonder what funny setting we've got here. I can see two as well. Well, there's no really big important cliffhangers so um if i can't change the settings i'm not spoiling anything for you uh, by showing you a second slide i wonder why it won't let me change this hmm not that way do you know what i'm going to i'm going to not share i'm going to use my slides as a prompt for me and i'm just going to talk to you colleagues if that's okay that work for you judith and katana you happy with that yeah, fine. Thank you. Yeah, thank we can, you. We thank can you. circulate the slides afterwards. There we go. We'll circulate them afterwards. I'll use them as a little reference point so I don't get too wildly off piste. So this is a real whistle stop tour of quite a complicated subject. Now, we introduced the concept of transitional safeguarding a few years ago and um, local areas like Brent. And I'll also give a shout out to Wiltshire, Hackney, Haringey, uh, parts of the northwest, Camden uh, are all really trying to grab a hold of this and, and, and make things basically make things different locally for your citizens. Now, I'll just say a little bit about the name. We deliberately called this idea transitional safeguarding, even though it is about activities which are far beyond the usual traditional boundaries of statutory safeguarding. We deliberately use the word safeguarding because safeguarding is everybody's business, because it's preventative, not only reactive, because without being safe, we can't be healthy. Without being safe, we can't learn. Safety is at the, you know, one of the core base conditions of Maslow's hierarchy for a reason. If we are not safe, very little else can follow. So we deliberately chose the word safeguarding, but we don't mean this is only the council's business within their social care departments, quite the opposite. This is about healthy, happy, safe, fulfilled communities. So when we think about why we argued for a, a different way of thinking, um, Ketan's already touched on some of the kind of the, the arguments for change. Teenagers are facing different types of harms to the ones we designed the child protection system for. Things like sexual exploitation, criminal exploitation, peer on peer violence, for example, trafficking. The child protection system was primarily designed to meet the needs of younger children facing harm in their families. The adult safeguarding system, where there's been lots of innovation and huge progress made in recent years, uh, but is still um, set up where, to, if you'll forgive my language, to qualify for safeguarding support as an adult. Um, you not only have to be facing abuse and neglect, but also have care and support needs, which mean you're unable to protect yourself. And those care and support needs are generally understood within the, the law and statutory guidance as being about having a disability or a health condition or mental health diagnosis. There's nothing wrong with that per se. And there are really good reasons why we try to limit how much the state intervenes in an adult's life, you know, like human rights. It makes me seem a bit quaint now being in favour of human rights these days. So I'm not arguing against that, but unfortunately it means we have a big gap because as a citizen turns 18, they can suddenly find that although their harm doesn't stop and the impacts of that harm doesn't stop, the trauma of that harm doesn't stop and their brains haven't even stopped developing, but perversely what stops is our support. As a professional response, put really, really bluntly colleagues, we walk away when the people who want to hurt our young citizens stick around. We need no stronger argument for change than that. But we do have some more arguments while I'm here. So exactly as Ketan says, transition to adulthood is a process, not an event. No one suddenly says, oh, I wake up on my 18th birthday and magically I've got capacity coursing through my veins and I'm able to make wise decisions. Some of us had to become adults before we were 18 
loved because we had caring responsibilities. Some of us became adults, most of us became adults long after our 18th birthday. It's a process, not an event. And that process is different depending on experiences, environments, adversities, expectations. So transitional safeguarding is about trying to create a system which is deliberately designed for kind of mid-teens to mid-twenties. I'm not going to give you an exact number because that's not my business. That's Brent's business. Yeah. Transitional safeguarding is about having a system that's deliberately designed for that life stage where we learn from the best of how we safeguard children and the best of our practice in safeguarding adults, but we do something quite specific for this life stage. Transitional safeguarding is about spanning the boundaries, not only the weird arbitrary boundary that we have on the 18th birthday, but also spanning the boundary between safeguarding and justice, safeguarding and health and well-being, spanning the boundary um, across geographical areas and professional disciplines. And also, I would say it's about getting away from this sort of pretense that we have nice neat boxes that our citizens fit in. People are not either vulnerable or culpable. You know? And yet our prisons are full of people who we've decided are culpable <coughs> rather than vulnerable. So we're trying to think about a system where notions of vulnerability and resilience are much more fluid and dynamic and situational. They're not a static label we put on a citizen um, and that remains true forevermore. It's all about promoting resilience, not rescuing, but promoting resilience, respecting people's rights and being person-centered in our practice. Now, I would argue personally um, that resources are both the problem and the solution when it comes to transitional safeguarding. It's really hard to imagine doing something different and innovative under the current conditions that local areas are expected to exist. I will not defend the indefensible funding position you find yourselves in, colleagues. However, the current binary system where we have these two completely different planets, one for safeguarding under 18s, one for safeguarding over 18s, with different thresholds, different government departments, different legislation, different practice frameworks, that current binary approach is remarkably poor value for money. And when we see that, it invites us to, to see resources and expenditure as part of the drive for change here. Now, back in 2018, we introduced the concept, and I don't want to take too much credit, we really just gave a voice to what professionals across multi-agency partners have been saying for decades. Um, we sort of just added some references and, and, and um, supported that argument. Now, we describe transitional safeguarding as a distinct approach to safeguarding adolescents and young adults, doing so fluidly across that life stage because, whisper it, the 18th birthday means absolutely nothing. It's simply not relevant. I mean, it feels it when you turn 18 and you're allowed in a pub, doesn't it? But it's not actually relevant to a citizen's needs. We describe transitional safeguarding as being an approach where we're learning from the best of these two systems rather than leaving a gap between them and where we're not only protecting young people but also preparing them for a healthy happy safe functioning adult life now when i say young people i'm using the united nations definition now they describe youth as 14 to 24. so i'm deliberately trying to discipline myself to use a transitional definition for young people I would never call a 22 year old a teenager, but I think it's absolutely reasonable that we talk about young people and young adults in that collective sense. It's very important I make clear to you that tra transitional safeguarding is not just transitions planning for citizens who are moving between children's mental health and adult mental health, or children's social care and adult social care. That quite frankly is our statutory duty and the very least we should be doing. Transitional safeguarding is trying to push us to, to think about activity which falls beyond the traditional definitions of transitions or safeguarding. You would think sometimes to look at the way policy um, discourse has evolved, you'd think that only people with disabilities went through transition. Goodness me, we all hope to go through the transition. It is the very least we hope for the children we work with and support is that we help them make it to adulthood. 
So we have to reclaim notions of transition. They are a broad human experience, not a particular status for particular groups of, I hate this term, service users. Oh, well, let's call them citizens. Let's call them what they are, active citizens with rights, not passive users of services. And, and the word safeguarding has come to mean in recent years, you know, just that sharp end statutory safeguarding. We don't mean that. We don't mean safeguarding as a noun, a destination, a threshold to be reached, a place to send citizens. We mean safeguarding as a verb. It's an act. It's a thing we do when our citizen safety is undermined. You sometimes hear it used as a noun. You might, for example, hear, oh, well, that's not safeguarding because DES hasn't got care and support needs. OK, well, we used to say that about teenagers being exploited, didn't we? That's not safeguarding because DES says she's her boyfriend. We were wrong. Safeguarding is a verb, not a noun. And in fact, although some colleagues might try and um, they might think that the law is the problem, the Care Act, which governs how we work with adults. Actually, the Care Act is pretty permissive. The Care Act tells us who we must support. It doesn't limit who we can support. So areas like Brent are, are being really creative and tenacious and thinking about how they can stretch the boundaries, span the boundaries, treat safeguarding as a verb rather than a noun. And of course, you know, transitional safeguarding aligns with lots of social work values, core justice, sector values. I'll just share with you very briefly these six key principles that we've drawn from the research. Um, I'm a bit strict on this. They're non-negotiable and you can't cherry pick them. OK, um, now we're very relaxed that the way colleagues in Brent are approaching transitional safeguarding is a bit different to how colleagues in Bath and North East Somerset are going about it because context matters. But. Whatever you're doing, you have to honour the six key principles. Number one, be evidence informed. Use robust, relevant research, use data, use your local professional wisdom and understanding of context and use the expertise of lived experience from your local citizens. This is what helps us define the problem and craft the solution. OK, it's got to be evidence informed. Number two. The system's got to be contextual, you could say ecological. Contextual safeguarding is a, a phrase coined by my good friend and colleague, Carleen Thurman. And what it means is we don't only focus on the individual, Desi's behavior, Desi's choices, Desi's vulnerabilities. We think about the places and spaces and contexts in which Desi is more or less safe. It's that kind of thinking that gets fast food outlets for your safeguarding subgroup table. That kind of thinking that says, Actually, if we're serious about making Brent a really safe place to live and grow up, that means that our local businesses, stewards of public spaces, our safeguarding partners, our health and well-being partners. Number three, the system has got to be deliberately developmental. At the moment, we have a system that treats everyone under 18 as if they're children and everyone over 18 as if they're adults, despite decades of research showing that our brains are still developing well into our mid-20s showing that our social and emotional development continues well into our mid-20s. So we have to be developmentally informed in how we design our system. Number four, it's got to be relational. Plans are important and paperwork matters and process has its place. And I'd never tell you not to do good performance management, but it's people that change lives. You know? People and the absolute unerring power of relational practice, of trust and authenticity. And you have practitioners doing this already in Brent. People who really go the extra mile and put their back into the relationship they have with these citizens. Number five, transitional safeguarding demands a very sharp focus on equalities, equity, diversity and inclusion. Because just like harm doesn't stop at 18 and the brain doesn't stop developing at 18 and trauma doesn't stop at 18, you know what doesn't stop at 18? Racism, ableism, classism, sexism, all the other forms of marginalization and discrimination. And in fact, when we don't address those issues, just like other forms of trauma, they store up bigger problems in adulthood, more expensive problems in adulthood. Because the later we intervene, the more expensive the intervention tends to be and the more intrusive the intervention tends to be. And number six, all the way through it like a stick of rock, the way you design a transitional safeguarding system in Brent and the actual offer you make to your young citizens has got to be participative. As much voice and choice and power as you can possibly squeeze into your thinking. And that matters especially with young people who have been coerced and controlled and manipulated by others. 
Put bluntly, the more worried we are about a young person, the more important it is that we are participative in how we help them be safe and feel safe. The temptation is to become so worried we stop being participative. The opposite is what we need. So those six principles are key. And like many parts of the country, Brent are trying to progress this with Real Women Vigor. I think there's lots we could learn from other parts of the system which are already more transitional, like special educational needs and disabilities, mental health commissioning, young carers entitlements, care leaders. Safeguarding is almost the only bit of the system left that still has this rather quaint binary setup, which is quite interesting. We can draw down some brilliant rights-based person-centered practice in how we safeguard adults. And we could draw up some innovation from how we safeguard children, contextual safeguarding being one example. There's lots of learning that can happen between health, safeguarding and justice. Three corners of a triangle and much to learn from each other there if we can just break down some of these silos. And of course, for local areas, crucially, the ones that are making the economic case. Because when we walk away from citizens, when they turn 17 and a half, they don't stop costing us money. They tip up in our mental health populations, our homelessness populations, our drug and alcohol misuse populations, in the only service with no waiting list, the criminal justice system. And indeed, they have their own kids. It is um, as inhumane as it is expensive to keep feeding this binary machine, which doesn't recognise the fluidity of this life stage. So happily enough for us, what's good for citizens is also good for the public purse. That doesn't happen very often in our careers, does it? It's a good chance to, uh, I think, really seize the agenda. In my last couple of seconds, I'll just share what other local areas are doing, which I think is really inspiring. The ones who I think are getting this right, or at least are, are making progress, because no one's got it cracked just yet. It's an emerging concept. The ones who are starting small, starting somewhere. I think in Brent, you've really ambitiously um, started to look at a pilot where some gang affected young people are being supported. I applaud your bravery. I encourage you to think about some other examples which might be a little less um, challenging. You don't want to demoralize yourself too early. That would be my little word of advice there. Go gentle on yourselves. Um, local airs, and I think you're a great example of this, where there is really clear, credible ownership from the top I've been absolutely delighted by the political interest in this in Brent. It's, it's you know, a testament to you really as a local area. The local areas that understand what they're trying to build here is a system, not another service. As soon as you make a transitional safeguarding service, you've got another set of thresholds. It's another silo, another boundary to span. You're trying to make a system. And in bringing your colleagues across multi-agency partners together, make sure that you're creating a salad, not a soup. You should still be able to see the unique and brilliant contribution of your school nurses, as opposed to your adult probation, as opposed to your children's social workers, as opposed to your youth workers. They should come together in, in a wonderful harmonious salad, not a big blended up generic soup where no one gets to know what they're brilliant at anymore. And I guess, um, and you will be starting to, I'm sure, see this in Brent, when we really meaningfully shift from problem displacement well, if only adults would pick them up, if only CAMS had dealt with this sooner, if only the police had done X into collective problem solving. How are we in Brent making sure that our teenagers and young adults are thriving, safe, happy, healthy, and are themselves going to go on to become really thriving, healthy, happy, safe parents of their own children perhaps one day? That's the prize we're aiming for. So this is not an issue of practitioner training, it's an issue of systems leadership. We're glad to be around some really ambitious system leaders. That's enough ranting from me, I think. Thank you very much indeed, Des. So really, I'm grateful to you for that um, overview. Um, really, I'm sure I have found it, you know, again, very um, educational. I'm sure many of our friends on our Zoom call will equally have found it um, hugely beneficial. And I'm seeing a lot of uh, claps uh, um, uh, signs going on the screen so thank you very much so um uh, friends um uh, as many of you will know did you know uh, this is um, supposed to be uh, very interactive and i'm very much looking forward to having your contribution and your questions so feel free to put them in the chat or, or just simply raise your hand and I will bring you in. And I know uh, one or two co colleagues have already indicated they wish to ask a question, but let me just start off uh, with a 
quick question to my colleague, Evelyn Emadota, uh, a, a, not, not just a superstar um, here in Brent, but, but a very senior social worker. So uh, Daz um, has been making a lot of reference to um, what we are doing in uh, Brent, uh, changing that, uh, uh, reclaiming that narrative um, for um, wellness and expanding the boundaries uh, for wellness, safe uh, and healthy living. So Evelyn, if I can just very quickly ask you to just say um, uh, to us very briefly, what is it um, uh, that, that we are doing here in Brent Bliss? Uh, and then I will take uh, um, one or two questions from the colleagues on the Zoom call. Uh, Evelyn, please. Good evening to everybody and thank you, um, Ketan. Um, as um, Des has said, um, that the area of, can, of um, transitional safeguarding, this is rather complex and we know that it involves extra familial risks to young people. And um, often it's been compounded um, by the binary concept in terms of safeguarding children and adults. And as Des has um, stated around the legislation, the legal framework around um, safeguarding children and adults. In Brent, we've recognized this from the excellent evidence from research partners, um, such as um, Des Holmes Research in Practice. And um, in terms of system leadership, we've been ably um, supported by our uh, um, politicians by asking us actually, how is it that we safeguard young people in Brent? So it's really important that actually the answer is not crafted from professionals, but it is participative in terms of actually those cohort who are impacted and carers who are impacted by transitional safeguarding, that we include them in the solution. So we don't have a panacea in Brent, but we are on that journey. And what we recognize, and we've got round the table, are colleagues from children's services, from adult social care, from community prevention, because it is a systems approach. And we do need colleagues from drug and alcohol services and the voluntary sector. In terms of scoping our response, it's not about um, having a new service, but it is about having pathways, particularly for those people who do not meet the statutory criteria for adult services in terms of care and support needs. And in doing that, um, our understanding around transitional safeguarding, we're not putting a cap in terms of 25, and we want to actually think about people up until the age of 30, because we recognize that actually in terms of development, people develop at different stages in life, and we really want people not to be excluded. Um, and some of the work that we have done um, during the pandemic is to recognize that there were a number of very vulnerable individuals who would come to us in terms of safeguarding. And actually um, they weren't meeting our eligibility criteria in terms of longer term engagement. And so we um, set up a service um, that is multi-agency, multidisciplinary, um, that doesn't work with people who are entitled to statutory service. And that's called the SMART team that we have in Brent. But additional to that, actually, what we're looking at are potential solutions for young people. And some of these people, actually, we have corporate responsibility because we are their parents. They have been in care. And as we know that um, there is a statutory responsibility up until 25 for these young people. And there is um, from government um, a likely, well, they're muting potentially that that could be extended till 30. I certainly know that when I was growing up at the age of 25, I needed support from my parents. And how is it that actually some of our most vulnerable 
young people, we cut off that line in terms of support at the age of 25. Hence in Brent, we're looking at our offer being extended up until the age of 30. And it is at its embryonic stages. And um, I absolutely accept um, Des's um, um, positive comments in terms of our ambitions around working with young people affiliated with gangs. But we do know that it's not only young people affiliated with gangs, it is modern day slavery, young people who are sexually exploited. So we really need to think about the range. And absolutely, it does need to come from bottom up approach rather than top down. And so it, it will take time because we need that granular conversation with people who are impacted. Um, and in terms of systems changes, I absolutely agree. It's not about having a new service. It's not about having a new team, but it is about us thinking collectively um, in terms of the best practice in children's service, best practice in adult service, and most importantly, actually, what our young people are looking for in terms of solutions so that they are protected from extra familial harm. Because sometimes, actually, that person who has told me that actually I need to be selling drugs and that's my social network. They have validity in my life because they're part of my social network and the fabric of my life. And it's about actually how can we re-engage that person so that they can be making relationship that works for them, that's not um, founded on exploitation. So it's around that and um, those are the ways that we're thinking um, in Brent. Um, we don't have a definitive model, but we will, and we have um, started to engage with partners and we certainly would love to come back to you um, when we are further down the journey um, around our offer. But as of now, when individuals do not meet the adult statutory criteria, there is a service that we will engage and have engaged um, with young people. I know that there has been a pilot um, that has involved colleagues in my service area in um, adult safeguarding. Um, and um, as Des said, whilst there is a criteria in terms of care and support, actually the CARE Act gives us much latitude because there is that preventative element and um, it is about practitioners being informed of those you know flex that we have within the legal framework so that we can use that and I'm encouraged that we do have um, the leadership in Brent that is thinking flexibly around this we have practitioners that challenge us in terms of actually what is the solution for this individual and it is about a person-centered approach and so we do need that flex in the system and I'm very grateful for our political colleagues who actually ask the difficult questions so that we can work collaboratively to find um, a response um, to the young people in Brent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Evelyn, for that. Um, friends, I did say to you that she was a superstar. Was I right or was I right? Thank you very much. I can see a number of questions uh, that are going uh, in the chat as well as the hands going up. And I know um, uh, Judith um, is also spanning those boundaries and uh, uh, I will be inviting um, Judith to say um, how she uh, and her organization uh, is um, reclaiming those narratives in just a few moments. But before that, let me just take a few uh, more contributions and uh, do uh, keep your comments coming uh, in the chat and uh, as um, Judith said at the outset, um, we do have the hashtag, so feel free to use that. And I think Judith, you said it's um, uh, healthy communities, right? Yes, that's right, yes. Thank you very much. So no, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, so let me just take Des and then I'll take more contributions. And, and, and do keep your comments going in the chat function as well, friends. Des? Thanks, Keta. Um, uh, first, I just wanted to applaud, is it Evelyn or Evelyn? 
I always say either. I lived in America for a while and they called, Ev called me Evelyn. And my, um, in this country, people say Evelyn. So I respond to both. <laughs> well, you're an absolute queen and I adored everything you said. And I, I wanted to stand up and whoop when you were speaking. But I want to draw attention to something. It's very important that political colleagues hear this. OK, this is a marathon and not a sprint. I don't want to hear any four week task and finish groups. OK, this is slow thoughtful, deliberative, inclusive change. When you're trying to change the world, go slow and go further. And I think that's really important for political colleagues, partly because in Brent you've shown such exceptional political leadership of the issue, which um, yeah, is really quite thrilling to me, but also because politicians are doers. You like fixing things quickly, you're movers and shakers. And I really want to draw attention to the slower, deliberative, thoughtful work that uh, Evelyn and her colleagues are leading. That's, that's important we hear that, I think. And I also want to make an offer. Um, I'm leading an event uh, in mid-July with a number of London boroughs. Um, and I'd like to offer a handful of places to senior colleagues in Brent, both to hear from you, but also to engage you in a network of some of your, uh, some other London boroughs who are also movers Thank and shakers. That's really, really very generous of you, Des. Thank mm. you very much. Uh, and uh, Des, you just talked about um, uh, um, uh, the political uh, will, uh, and uh, we are so lucky to have um, uh, a wonderful political leaders. Uh, uh, until recently, um, deputy leader of the council, Margaret. So good to be able to uh, have your company. And I know you have a, a question, and uh, it'd be really good to have your question, please. And Faye, I can see your hand going up. Uh, I will bring you in in just a, a wee moment, and I know one or two other colleagues wants to come in as well. Uh, but I will be bringing as many of you as I possibly can. But Margaret, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ketan. And first and foremost, I'd just like to thank you for your work um, um, for the Transitional Safeguarding Task Group. It was a fantastic piece of work. I'm really disappointed I didn't see Des in an evidence session, but, um, um, but I did participate when I became lead member last December for six months um, uh, through Transitional, and it's a fantastic piece of work, and I'm delighted to see how it's moving forward. Um, but what I did want to ask you, Des, is what's your thoughts on actually taking this process forward and actually accelerating it? Do you think um, the integration of the CYP and the adult social care statutory rules would actually facilitate that? And where do you see the role of public health within this? Wow, what a fantastic question. Thank you, Des. I can see why you're the gaffer, Margaret. Very insightful question. Um, so I think there's a few things. I'm, I am uh, pretty persuaded that form follows function. And I think we mess around with um, form quite often because we are confused by function. So I'm a little bit nervous of structural integration as a solution to anything. Um, not least because we pay an awful lot of attention to the hard bits. You look at health and social care integration, it's all protocols, pathways, funding, lanyards, car parks, but it's not the hard bits that make or break your innovation, is it? it's the soft bits, ethos, ego, emotion, values, culture. And so there might be something for Brent and other areas to pull off here where you're achieving greater cultural alignment and integration without, frankly, the faff and distraction of structural change. Um, it's a personal view, but certainly the evidence around health and social integration is that um, we haven't yet seen the change in outcomes, but we have spent a lot of money and heartache and headache getting where we are so far. That said, I think there are some parts of the system which the evidence suggests should be much more integrated. I would say youth justice and children's services might be one example. Um, they are the same kids. They are the same kids. We've just decided some are at risk and some are a risk. Um, now, public health, I think, are key. When I when I um, do stuff around transition safeguarding with health colleagues, public health and mental health, but particularly public health, immediately get it. No one understands social determinants, you know, and life course approaches better than our public health colleagues. No one has better data than our health colleagues, and a, and a clearer commitment to creating policy 
and strategy based on community engagement and participation. There is some methodological um, talent in public health that we're not always tapping into as well as we could. I would say the same around participative practice. Some of the best participation workers you have are not called participation workers. They're working in your resi units. They're fostering your teenagers. You know, They're managing behavior in one of your local schools. So really thinking quite creatively about the talent you have available. I would focus on integration and alignment of skills and function more than structure, personally. I don't Thank know if you. that helps. Thank you very much, uh, Faye. Sorry to be keeping you waiting. Uh, thanks, Des, for that um, wonderful, uh, comprehensive reply. Uh, Faye, please. Hi, thank you so much. Um, fantastic talk. Um, first of all, I've worked a long time within the therapy bounds years ago with St. Thomas's Hospital and then at the school in South London. And I'm still involved with safeguarding uh, with the Byborough in a way, with Kensington and Westminster, a group of us. Um, and what's interesting is I love the way you talk about integration of the system. It's a slow process. It's not a tick box for four sessions and we finish and you have to have an outcome. What came out years ago, and we're still talking about it, is the preventative the recognition of, of safeguarding, not when it gets to a crisis point and they finally come into the team. And so when we worked at the school, we had a, I was at a school which started from the nursery school that went right up to the HGCSC level. And that was absolutely wonderful because we worked as a team across both um, the, 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 the primary sector leading into the senior sector until they went to college. And so there was a consistency. So I had a child for therapy for sometimes four or five years before we finally started seeing results and got the nitty gritty and everybody working together. And here we are, 2022, and we're kind of in a way talking the same talk, same intentions. That's not consistent across the board. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to kill Joy. So it's refreshing to see what's happening now. But guys, we're 32 or 33 boroughs across London. There needs to be a consistency of practice. There needs to be a preventative within the schools, right from the word go. And when we talk about the transitional, I had a, a child and I mean, she was very special. I, you know, I still think about her sometimes. We, who went through exactly what you talked about. She got to the level where she reached the age 16 and she got cut off. And this was a child with lots of background issues. And suddenly she had different therapists who she didn't relate to. And basically whatever we worked to get to that point disintegrated. And this is what happens sometimes. Thank you. So I'm just saying to you guys, well done, Brent. Thank you. Uh, Westminster and Kensington are working very hard on this, but we need to see it across the boroughs. And that's where projects and events like this, because uh, communities, for sure, cultural comes a big role in it, because some people think it's a stigma. And we have to remove that stigma and we have to reach the whole cohort of communities, not just the favorite areas where money is being thrown at. Thank so you very much for that, Faye. Yes, Des. Very, very quickly, I'd like to respond on that. Um, uh, I absolutely agree with you. On, apart from one tiny point, if I may, Faye, I don't think we need absolute cookie-cutter consistency across all London boroughs because place and context matters. But we do need absolute relentless coherence. And that's Thank what's you. lacking. But I would just want to give you a heads up. That enduring relationship you described, we can establish those relationships using our community sector, our faith sector. It's really important that councils and statutory partners are humble here. We aren't necessarily going to stick around for as long as we need to, and some of our voluntary and community sector partners can. So let's be humble in terms of leadership. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Anish, please. Uh, Anish, okay. uh, really good to see you uh, again. Thank you for joining. Pleasure. Sorry, I'm taking this meeting on the go as well. Uh, but I think I would love to address a uh, phase point here. Faye, this is, uh, as this wouldn't be a tick mark activity from Brent. Uh, uh, let me introduce myself. I work with Brent Health Matters Program. It is in conjunction with Public Health in Brent. The idea of the program is to address health inequalities within the borough. And my thematic remit is to work alongside children and young people. 
So as part of the program, we work alongside a lot of volunteer organizations, community champions, schools, and uh, part of the statutory services. But a lot of our stakeholders are involved are our CCG, PCNs, and uh, the GP services. So it's a very collaborative approach that we have already adapted to address these uh, issues. And it, this is not something which is a short-term or tick mark activity for six months. The program started in late 2020s. And in a year, we have uh, worked in collaboration and, um, and we have reached great heights in terms of reaching out to hard to reach people. I, we still don't call them hard to reach. It's our attempt. We are not reaching them in the way that we should be engaging with them. So we taking more community-based approach to address these issues. And uh, I, I think, you know, it, as you said, it's not something that would be taken or addressed in a very short time. It's a long-term approach. And uh, I think a year in the program, I can definitely vouch and say that Brent is taking this seriously, addressed health inequalities within the borough. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gloria, you have, thank you very much for that, Anish, grateful to you. Gloria, you had a couple of um, uh, points on chat. I don't know if that um, answers your point, but feel free to come in, Gloria. And Gloria, by the way, is one of my other colleagues from uh, CNWL. Thank you, Gloria. No, in fact, the points I think have been mainly answered because my concern is that as much as the family try to help or outsiders try to help, Children spend an awful lot of time both in school or in universities or in colleges or working. And I think that is also an essential part of where they do need safeguarding and protecting. That's all. Thank you very much. Emma, I saw your hand go up and it's gone down again. I don't know whether you wanted to contribute. Uh, if you do, then very happy to uh, have your contribution. Emma? Thank you. I uh, take it that um, uh, um, your, your point has been answered by the contributions. Um, Des, uh, I just want you now just come uh, to, uh, Anita, I'm just seeing your point. Uh, okay. Uh, did you want to ask your point, Anita, before I um, ask um, uh, one or two questions that I wanted to raise with Des, Anita? Yeah, I was uh, on the lines of a, a talk that... And good to see you, Anita, on this Zoom call. Thank you very much for joining. My Wi-Fi is a bit poor, so if, if I put the camera on, I might end up not... No problem, <laughs> no problem. My, my thoughts were around that if young people do not meet uh, the criteria of statutory safeguarding, would it not be an idea that long-term we develop uh, much more community-oriented structures to support uh, young people from that transition, because not every child, or sorry, every young person will meet the criteria. So just wanted to see a future, a vision, that perhaps we could work towards this, that would be more of a preventative strategy in my mind. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful question. Thank you, Anita. Um, Des, please. So I think, and um, Evelyn will come in and correct me if I'm wrong, I think that is exactly what the smart service is, is aiming to do, to create a response for those citizens who don't, forgive my language, meet the bar, you know, um, in terms of statutory safeguarding. And I think that's exactly what um, what's so exciting, what Evan was describing. And local areas across the country are doing exactly that. They're saying, well, okay, so technically statutory safeguarding services are under pressure of big resource constraints, but that's not the only way in which we keep our, help our citizens to be safe and feel safe. And, and Evelyn mentioned this, I want to bring attention to it again. People blame the law. They say, oh, the law won't let us work with someone over 18 unless they have these very high levels of needs. That same bit of legislation has a whole section about prevention and how we all have a duty to prevent, reduce and delay these care and support needs emerging. So Evelyn and her team are very, very sensibly leveraging the, the, the permissions within the current statutory framework. And then I think making a really strong case for investment locally for an alternative, more preventative service, because that 19 year old who's been you know, experiencing trauma and exploitation or difficulties in adolescence, there is a preventative argument to make here for meeting their needs before they worsen. It is better to, it's better for citizens and it's better for the public purse. So I think that's exactly what's being described and more power to you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Richard, do you, do you have a question? 
Uh, I saw your hand go up, uh, but it's gone down again. Thanks, Kertan. It wasn't um, actually a question. So if you've got time, it's just going to be a point about... Me too. Um, Good to see you. But good to see you too and and it's been really uh wonderful to um hear the contributions from people and i i just wanted to add that i think um i i think you'll find that a lot you know you mentioned there about the voluntary sector and i think you'll find that a lot of professionals a lot of us who work in this field are kind of already signed up to this way of thinking and i myself i work at the brent center for young people and we've been very lucky to be working in brent for 54 years now with 14 to, uh, and it was 24 year olds, but you know, unfortunately because of the constraints, we take referrals now up to 21, but we still do work with young people up to 24 who are still in our services. And you know, that's what I would say, 54 years of understanding that adolescence does not end at 18 and the needs of these young people do not end at 18. Um, and you know, what we're really glad to see is that now we are beginning to get statutory services to move in the direction that we have always been working in um, to work with us past that 18 point and to think about, you know, the ways that we need to work together around holding young people around so that we're, what we're not doing is cliff edge, uh, cliff edge approach to transitions that exactly has been said transitions are something that all young people go through. Um, and also, you know, as you said, the preventative work and, and the charity and the voluntary sector are, are absolutely essential in providing um, that kind of early intervention. Our work is psychotherapeutic mental health work. And we are, you know, we're at, our work is absolutely essential in conjunction with our partners in CAMS, in the NHS, um, in children's services to provide that support to young people in our borough. And I'm glad to see Brent is leading the way in this again, because as I said, you know, we, we have been doing this work for a number of years throughout the borough. Thank you very much uh, for that, Rita. Really grateful uh, for that contribution. Um, Diane, you had a just quick uh, point that I just saw in the chat. Do you want to put your point, please? Diane? Diane Collins. Off camera. Thank you very much. Thank I'm you for camera. joining. I just wanted to ask, um, as I said in the chat, what happens to a young citizen who's now out of the bar? and in rented accommodation. What happens to those people? Because um, we have in the borough, which some people might not know, um, the word in Kukuin, um, made crime. And sometimes these young people not a fault of their own because they have known these people through um, street, being streetwise. They're being set upon or being used. How can we address those issues? And, how the lady who just spoke last, I don't have her name. Is there any form of system, anything that you can help us as counselors or whether someone is a social worker? I know the social workers have that up their sleeve, but for members of the public, how do you address those issues? I know this is long winded, but I do not want to divulge confidential information. Thank you. Um, here today. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, point, Diana. I don't know whether you have anything to, um, uh, uh, to uh, say by way of a response there, so Evelyn. I won't respond um, to, to that mostly. It might be more useful that perhaps local colleagues who have services and links to offer pick that okay. up. It wouldn't be right for me to comment. Fine. But I think the point that Rita was making, um, you reminded me, Rita, a few years ago, pre-COVID, I was doing a workshop with a bunch of local authorities and police and health partners. And one director of children's services, about transfer safeguarding, one director of children's services said, we've got a great service that works with our criminally exploited young people up to 18. We need them to keep working well into their 20s, at which point the chief executive of this charity stood up and shouted, we do you just don't fund it um, and I suppose I want to emphasize that up and down the country every single minute of every single day voluntary and community sector organizations um, including very very informally uh, grouped organizations are working in a boundary spanning way we need to legitimize and normalize the work they do so my question I guess to very senior colleagues is how often are you overseeing joint scrutiny how often are you bringing together your boards? How are you creating the conditions in which we have more flexible boundary spanning Thank community you. arrangements? Thank you. Um, uh, as I said at the outset, one hour is never enough for this uh, hugely um, 
uh, interesting um, but complex area. But uh, as I've said, this is just the start of the conversation uh, and, and we will be revisiting this in uh, months to come. But um, I'll bring Colin in very quickly. Colin, um, we are fast running out of time. So, you know, 30 seconds and then I'll want to bring Judith in because I want to hear what Judith and her team are doing to spanning those uh, boundaries uh, placed. Colin? I just wanted to respond to Diane, really. Diane Thank talked you. about potentially vulnerable people in vulnerable Thank situations. You. Good to see you. Hello. Potentially contact your local advocacy provider. Um, it's, if it's a vulnerable person that has got care and support needs, um, then the advocacy service should be able to provide some support to you, Diane. Thank you very much, Colin, for that very, very helpful uh, uh, and very uh, quick response. Grateful to you. Uh, and uh, friends, again, um, we will be re revisiting this uh, particular subject in a um, few months' time and, and perhaps we'll be able to explore many more conversations. Uh, uh, but let me bring Judith, and I know uh, that uh, Judith and her team are leading on a piece of work um, uh, around this, and it's good to be able to hear that contribution as well before we mm, finish this one over. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as you know, we work with both adults and children and young people. And a couple of years ago, we did a piece of survey work across the 10 or so boroughs in which we work um, to try and find out what, what residents, what people understood by safeguarding and the level of knowledge about what safeguarding is or how to refer in was, was really low. So it made us realize we needed to do a job of work around raising awareness of what safeguarding is, helping people understand how to access it, those, um, those kinds of things. And in doing that work, we then identified that there were quite a lot of blocks and barriers for particular people or particular communities. So um, just as for instance, in Westminster and Kensington, Chelsea, we're working um, as part of a multi-agency team there to look at what those blocks and barriers for particular um, community groups are. So we've targeted, or we're working with 18 um, micro community groups to, to raise awareness, to do training, that capacity building, so that there's more of an understanding about how to keep, uh, you know, how people can keep themselves safe as, as well as their communities. And um, we're also doing another piece of work and it's just starting to do this piece of work in Brent with the Safeguarding Adults Board, looking at the distribution of demographics in safeguarding data and comparing that to the demographics of the borough so that we can look at what groups are overrepresented, what groups are underrepresented so that we can... Um, you know, put a put a plan together to raise that awareness and remove those blocks and barriers. So I think this kind of work is really important in relation to prevention. 